All right, ladies and gentlemen, so our screencast for today is going to focus on our last topics for time period number seven. Uh, so the first part um, of our screencast is going to focus on the Great Depression, and then the second part, part two, will focus on World War II. Uh, so when we start with taking a look at the Great Depression, so this is you know, a monumental economic catastrophe within the United States. So really what we're going to kind of start with is what caused the Great Depression and then our different presidents' responses to it, Herbert Hoover's response to it, FDR's response to it. So some good ways to do analysis here is comparatively, Hoover and FDR, what are their different approaches? What are their different philosophies towards government, towards uh, you know providing aid to Americans during the Great Depression? Um, so that's a good way to kind of analyze uh, some of the different things that are happening during the Depression. All right, so first big thing is to understand is that the Depression does not start with the stock market crash of 1929. There are a lot of underlying issues with the 1920s economy that um, are kind of exploited and kind of come to light after the, the stock market crash happens in 1929. So the first big one, um, we're just going to touch on a few. There are some other ones that we talked about when we were in class, so you might want to take a look at some of those other ones as well. Well, one of the first big ones is this growing wealth inequality. So, you know, uh, wealth is not really being shared equally across the American uh, socio socioeconomic classes during the 1920s. So it's different than, say, like the 1950s that we talked about. Uh, and if you see here, the, the top 1% is growing wealthier and wealthier in the 20s. Uh, and we're kind of going towards a similar time period now. This is a little bit old at this point, 2007. It's even increased more where the top 1% holds a significant amount of money. So it's similar to the Gilded Age in that sense, and that um, is not necessarily a reliable distribution of wealth within the nation. Another big thing is this over-reliance on consumerism and credit buying. Uh, and really what's happening here, because of all this consumerism and credit buying, um, it's creating like a bubble where it seems like the economy is really doing well and expanding, but a lot of it's uh, being built off of um, luxury consumer products uh, and then also credit purchasing and credit buying. Um, another thing that's happening here is a lot of overproduction of goods and products, uh, and that includes agricultural products as well as manufactured products. And the purchasing power of Americans is declining in the 20s. Wages are staying flat, uh, and their purchasing power as each year kind of goes on in the 20s is declining. So there's a lot of underlying issues um, with the 20s economy. And like I said, that kind of just brushes the surface of some of the issues. Um, there are a lot of other issues kind of going on um, that you should kind of take a look at you know, during the 1920s. Now, the stock market crash of 1929 uh, is really going to kind of facilitate uh, kind of a domino effect in the American economy. And so after the stock market kind of crashes here, uh, there's two subsequent days. You have Black Thursday, and then the market kind of rebounds a little bit right here. And then you have Black Tuesday where it kind of like really plummets and there's panic selling happening across the stock market. Now what you have to understand is kind of like the domino effect that happens here as a result of the stock market crash. The stock market is where private citizens can invest in companies uh, and essentially when they start pulling their money out of these companies, a lot of these companies are going to end up you know, going bankrupt and losing money and that's going to kind of spill over into other aspects of the economy. Um, so mainly one of the first big ways that it affects the average American, because the average American really does not have money in the stock market, uh, one of the first big ways it can affect them is through unemployment and underemployment. So you have about 25% of Americans are unemployed uh, once the Great Depression really kind of hits um, some of its peaks in the early 1930s. Uh, and so massive unemployment, but you also have massive underemployment where people uh, maybe are working part time or can't find a job that can um, make ends meet or maybe working in a job that they're overqualified for. And that's like another 25% of, of Americans are kind of underemployed during the depression. So you have unemployment, you have underemployment. Uh, now, what also is kind of adds to the, to the catastrophe is that a lot of Americans who did save money for a potential economic catastrophe like this are going to end up being victims of these things called bank runs. So in the time period, this is before you have the FDIC and federal insurance of banks. And so uh, if, you know, if, you're, if you went to the bank and uh, there was you know, a rush at the bank to, for people to take out their deposits and they didn't have your money on hand at the time uh, and the bank ended up closing, you would simply lose all of your savings and lose all of your money that you had put aside. And that happens to you know, thousands upon thousands, if not millions of Americans who are victims of 
bank failures during the Great Depression. So uh, that kind of adds to the catastrophe of uh, Americans not being able to sustain this difficult time. Now, there are massive effects socially as well. Um, so some of the social effects of the stock market crash is since people are losing their jobs and they're losing their savings, a lot of people become homeless. So you have these uh, makeshift shanty towns popping up all over uh, different big cities in the United States called, and they're, they're gonna nickname them Hoovervilles uh, after the president of the United States, Herbert Hoover. And you also have uh, people who are literally you know, starving. And so they're going to line up on uh, bread lines uh, for food and go to soup kitchens for food. Uh, and so you have massive economic effects of the stock market crash and massive social effects. And they're intertwined with each other, the economic effects are influencing the social effects that are happening, but um, you have widespread, uh, you know, issues facing Americans across different uh, classes during during this whole era of the Great Depression. Now, Hoover's response to the Depression uh, is going to be one of kind of emphasizing this idea of volunteerism uh, and pledges. So really what he wants is he wants uh, businesses to make these volunteer pledges to not lay off Americans and to um, not cut wages of their workers. And so it works in the beginning to a certain extent. He gets people to actually make these pledges, some businesses to make these pledges. Uh, but ultimately economics kind of wins out and they start laying people off because they can't keep their businesses afloat. Uh, there's nothing binding these ideas. So he kind of takes his concept from when he was uh, in charge of the Food Administration during uh, World War I and tries to apply that same concept of volunteerism that worked during World War I but really does not work here. Uh, the other idea is kind of like a traditional American idea, this idea of rugged individualism. And rugged individualism is this concept that Americans can kind of be, rely on themselves and have some self-reliance and be able to kind of pull themselves up out of this difficult situation. And that goes way back, you know, to like the colonial American concept of individualism and being able to make it uh, here in the United States as part of the American dream. Uh, now, one of the things that Hoover is very reluctant to do is to provide direct aid to citizens. And so instead, he's going to rely on private charities and private organizations and state governments provide direct aid to the people because he doesn't want Americans to become dependent on the federal government for aid. Now, as the depression worsens in his term, uh, he's going to uh, offer some form of direct aid through works projects. And so what you're looking at here is the Hoover Dam, which is a famous uh, you know, public works project that Hoover is going to uh, sponsor. So he really is not big into these public works projects, and he really doesn't want to kind of give out any form of like welfare or direct aid to citizens. Uh, and so uh, because of this, you see, you know, wide scale political um, effects of the stock market crash as well. Uh, so what you're looking at here is the election of 1932 and Hoover is in red uh, in the election, the Republican candidate and the FDR is in blue. And so if you look here, uh, Hoover's response to the Great Depression uh, and um, you know, his subsequent, I guess, failure in the American people's eyes to solve the issues of the Great Depression uh, really kind of leads to a huge landslide political victory by FDR. And FDR is going to come in with a totally different philosophy towards how to uh, solve the issues that are facing Americans. And it's going to be much more government interventionist uh, as to how to solve it, much more direct aid, a much more public works project. So you want to kind of look at the new, the, the new deal that FDR is going to kind of champion here as a major turning point in how uh, the federal government is going to interact with its citizens and how Americans kind of view the federal government. In a lot of ways, it's building off the progressive era. In a lot of ways, it's kind of a new concept here. Now, FDR is going to have uh, two major new deals. So the first new deal is from 1933 to 1935. And the second new deal is kind of in his, uh, from his first term going into his second term, 1936 to 1938. Uh, and FDR's New Deals, this is really kind of his, uh, like all of his programs kind of combined are known as the New Deal. And that's all the different things that he kind of comes up with to try and stem the tide of the Great Depression. Uh, so we talked about it in class, we, we threw his programs into di different categories. So relief and recovery programs, we called it the three R's. Uh, so these are some of the famous relief and recovery programs. And we're really not going to go through them each individually. But what they all kind of have in common is 
They're both, they're all trying to revive the economy and get the economy moving again and get money moving again. Um, and they're also all trying to provide jobs and direct aid to people. And so these are all public works projects, except for, you know, the AAA, which is trying to help farmers. Uh, but they're all trying to uh, potentially rebound the United States and help it to recover. And this is part of FDR's philosophy toward the economy and the government, uh, very much influenced by the economist Jane, John Maynard Keynes and this idea of Keynesian economics. In order to get the economy moving again, the government's going to have to spend and use large amounts of spending to kind of like, they would call it prime the pump and kind of get uh, the government, uh, excuse me, to get the economy um, circulating money. Now, he also is going to institute a lot of reform programs. Uh, and so a lot of these reform programs are designed at fixing aspects of the uh, American economy so that this problem doesn't happen again. Uh, so you have some financial reforms like the Glass-Steagall Act and the FDIC to kind of uh, protect people when they're, um, when they're investing and in putting their money in banks. Um, you also have the Wagner Act, which is going to legalize unions and legalize collective bargaining. Uh, and then also Social Security in the Second New Deal, this principal old age program, you know, try and help Americans uh, as they reach retirement age. Uh, so like FDR is really trying to hit on different facets, trying to help recover the economy, help to provide relief to Americans who are out of work, and then also trying to bring massive reform. So I think this is a very important um, uh, situation in American uh, politics and American history. Uh, this is a fundamental change for the government, how the government functions, what we expect the government to do. Uh, and really it's going to be a, a major um, expansion of liberalism into the government. And so you want to again make the connection to the progressive era and kind of see like what do you see as connections between the progressive era and the New Deal. All right, now there's going to be a lot of criticisms of the New Deal. They come from the right and from the left. So you have uh, people on the left who feel like FDR has not gone far enough and he didn't provide enough direct help to, to the poor. Um, then you also have people on the right who kind of feel like this is moving America in kind of like more of a communist socialist direction where the government is too involved and Americans are relying way too much on the government for, um, for help and for aid. And so you have criticism coming from both sides. Uh, and you also have... FDR, who's going to get criticized uh, for some of his specific actions that he tries to take, and what you're looking at here in this cartoon uh, is the court packing scandal, where FDR tries to kind of load the court up and tries to add six more justices, which Congress, you know, eventually rejects. Uh, and the reason he's doing that is because the well, wants to do that is because the Supreme Court is declaring, you know, a bunch of his New Deal programs unconstitutional in the era. Uh, so he's going to get criticism. Um, both in the time period and after as well. Okay, now one thing that we kind of skipped here, so I want to go back, uh, which because kind of kind of spans both uh, the first New Deal, the second New Deal, and a little bit, and even in Hoover's administration as well, is a major um, natural disaster that's striking the country, known as the Dust Bowl. And you know, the Dust Bowl is this awful, uh, these awful dust storms that are sweeping across Middle America at the time. And they're caused by kind of a combination of overproduction that's happening on the Great Plains, um, lack of rain, uh, and kind of the soil losing its fertility. Uh, and what you end up happen have happening is a mass uh, movement of people, um, a migration from the, the Midwest to out to, to like the West Coast and California. And so we kind of talked about this in class. Uh, and you're looking at you know, a famous photograph from Dorothea Lange. Uh, who kind of captured the the experience of these uh, migrants who are moving out west. Uh, and so this is happening during the Depression, so it's kind of adding another element to the Depression. You have people already in poverty losing their homes, and now they're dealing with this awful natural disaster you know, at the same time. So this is also captured in the famous novel, The Grapes of Wrath, by um, uh, John Steinbeck. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of things happening during the Great Depression. The government is, is the government's relationship with the people is changing. Um, you have natural disasters facing the country, uh, and you also have uh, Americans really kind of uh, overcoming a lot of the difficulties uh, that they're facing. Um, so the second part of our screencast is going to, or second part of this is going to kind of focus on World War II, and that'll kind of wrap us up for time period number seven.